Reading between the lines of a video published by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that tells us the three players they were considering taking in the first round of the NFL draft. That and more on today's episode of Locked On Bucks. You are Locked On Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs> Welcome into this Monday episode of Locked On Bucks, your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, for making Locked On Bucks your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can follow me, your host, David Harrison, D Harrison82 on Twitter, credential member of the media and staff writer over at BucksGameDay.com part of Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation, covering your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Here with you every Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. And as always, we want to share our appreciation for your continued support of the show. On today's episode of Locked on Bucks, the Buccaneers are experiencing another huge drop in numbers, and it's not power rankings this time. But first, we're going to discuss some interesting comments revealed in a video on the team's website that leads me to believe I know the top the team's top three targets on day one of the NFL draft. And we'll discuss all that on this episode of Lockdown Bucks, which is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash on today to get started. In the video released by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, recently we got a behind-the-scenes glimpse of kind of what happens in the war room, a war room situation as the Bucks get closer to getting on the clock for the first time in the first round of the upcoming or of the recently had April NFL draft. That's a confusing way of saying that the video opens up on coach Tobble saying, quote, that Iowa linebacker is a Dan Campbell kind of guy End quote Dan Campbell. If you don't know, is the head coach of the Detroit lions. And we know, of course, the Detroit lions picking at number 18 did in fact select Iowa Hawkeye linebacker, Jack Campbell, one pick ahead of where the bucks took pit defensive lineman, Kalijah Canty. Now, this is where the video starts to open up a whole lot of speculation, right? And this is only like a two minute and some change video. And we're about to talk about it for like 15 minutes. That's how much you can kind of pull from this video. If you're really a little bit insane, like I kind of am sometimes, but the next thing you hear in the video is GM Jason lights voice asking someone, we don't really know who he's asking, but someone quote, are we worried about Detroit? Then he asks quote, how many picks do they have now? We see, we seem to hear a little bit of a discussion about potential trade ideas. He kind of asks, like, oh, they have some thirds and some fourths, but it's not really clear whether or not they're speculating about the Lions trading, about the Bucks trading, or hell, through the magic of editing, it may not even have been a clip or a quip from that time period, right? They could have taken that from earlier in the day uh, and just did it for the magic of, of video making, right? So as you hear the NFL announce in the Buccaneers war room that Detroit is on the clock. Jason Light expresses a little concern over whether or not the Lions are going to take Kalijah Kansi. So it kind of supports the idea that Kansi was the guy that they were after. And then there's some celebratory gestures that would seem to be uh, after they found out that Kansi was not going to the Detroit Lions and would still be available for the Buccaneers at pick number 19. Now we cut to a scene of Todd Bowles being interviewed directly by the team's media team. And he says, quote, we still had two guys on the board that we really liked on the board with Kansi being one of them. And we had a shot either way Detroit picked. And when Detroit picked the other way and picked the linebacker, we got a chance to get Kansi. You know, it was pretty good. It was a great feeling, actually. End quote. Light says later in the video that the Bucks got to a point where they decided they were going to sit. They were going to wait. They weren't going to trade up. And that they have three players on their board at that time that they were targeting. He says that they, as the players started getting selected, those three players, he started getting a little bit nervous, but he says that Kalijah was on the top of that list. Kalijah Kansi was on the top of that list, but with Detroit feasibly targeting a defensive lineman, defensive tackle, which I think they did end up taking in the third round, he was starting to sweat a little bit that Kansi would be gone. Now, there's some interesting lines to read in between here, uh, and depending on how you read them, you'll come away with some idea of where the Buccaneers were looking to go on draft night. From Bowles' comments, you can get the idea that it was going to either be linebacker Jack Campbell out of Iowa or Kalijah Kansi, the defensive lineman out of Pitt that they ended up taking, that it was going to be one of those two guys. He says, quote, we still had two guys on the board. Then he says, and we had a shot either way Detroit picked. Then he says, when Detroit picked the other way, right, we got a chance to get Kansi. That's 
kind of an um, uh, amalgam of of quotes there. But to me, that certainly sounds like Todd Bowles saying that we had two guys on our list that we wanted with Detroit on the board. Obviously, they can only pick one player. Even if they trade out, whoever trades up can only pick one player. So one of our two guys is going to be there. When they took the other guy that was on our list, like I'm filling in the words there, but that's how it sounds to me, right, is when they took the other guy, we took the main guy. The other guy would be off-ball linebacker Jack Campbell out of, uh, again, out of the Iowa Hawkeyes program. I think that is very, very interesting. If you listen to it, uh, like I said, it sounds like the Bucks had an off-ball linebacker on their list of potential guys that they could pick at number 19. But of course, we're really just scratching the surface of this conspiracy theory, guys. We're really just talking about the first part of this thing because the Jason Light part, that there were three players that they had on that list, that intrigued me a little bit. I wanted to see if I could go figure out, do a little sleuthing and see if I could figure out who that third guy is. I think I've got that guy figured out, and I think Jack Campbell is that second guy. Obviously, Kalaja Kansi is the top guy. But I'm going to tell you who the third guy is. That's next on today's episode of Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In today's episode of Locked On Bucks is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if the first bet doesn't win. The Denver Nuggets are currently up three games to none over the Los Angeles Lakers in the Western Conference Finals of the NBA playoffs and are three and a half point underdogs. In game four, Monday night, I've already got my money in on the Nuggets to cover the points and win that game four and sweep the Los Angeles Lakers. But that's a tall task and sweeping anybody is hard in the NBA playoffs. A win for the Lakers would make it 3-1, still in favor of the Nuggets. But currently, the Los Angeles Lakers have plus 1,700 odds to do what no NBA team has ever done and come back from down 3 nothing in the Western Conference Finals. If you think there's a chance that LeBron James and the Lakers are going to make that history, then you could win $85 on a $5 bet right now. That's the odds you're going to get. If you bet on the Lakers to win the Western Conference Finals, you will make $85 on $5 if they make it actually happen. Do the math. The more you bet, the more you could potentially win. No matter what you bet, there's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thanks for making Locked On Bucks your first listen or view of the day. Every day, every day or tomorrow, come back and James Jarko will be back with me here on the program. We look forward to having James back again. So we were just talking about Coach Bowles' comments on this video put out by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers media group. Uh, and how they seem to be pointing at the Buccaneers having Iowa linebacker Jack Campbell pretty high on their board, maybe a little bit higher than a lot of people realize or expected. And if you combine those comments with Jason Light's comments about having three guys they really liked once they decided they weren't going to make a move up the board, then you can start looking at adding one more player to the list of the top targets the Bucs had entering the first round, right? So if you combine the comments, then there were three guys on this list when they decided not to move up and two were left when they picked number 18 uh, or not when they picked, but when number 18 came around the Detroit lions, there were still two guys left. Kalaja Kansi was number one. And to me, this is where the analysis of this is going to get individualized. It really just kind of depends on where you think the Buccaneers drew that line. Now, if I've got three guys, if I'm in the war room and I've got three guys, for me to get to a point where I say, okay, we're not trading up anymore. Like we're not talking about trading up at this point. That line for me is going to be one and a half times the amount of guys I'm in love with. So the more guys I'm in love with, the deeper that line can go, right? Well, if we've got three guys on that, on that list of three guys that we could love, then you've got one and a half times that that's four and a half. So three times 1.5 is 4.5. And in a high stakes game game like this, I'm not rounding up. I'm not going to, I'm not going up to five. I'm going down to four. So if that's how light Jason light and the bucks think, and they follow my line of thinking, then that means all three of their targets were available within four picks of number 19, which is when they said we're not trading up anymore. That's, that's the math that I'm doing. Again, that's just my personal opinion on how that would work out. Now, one of those players came off the board before pick number 18, right? Cause Jason light said that, 
as you know, as soon as our, our guys started coming off the board. And then Todd Bowles said we had two that we were looking at, which means Jason Light said there's three. Todd Bowles said there were two coming into pick 18. So you do the math. One guy came off before 18. Who is that guy? Well, using that math and that logic, four picks ahead of number 19 is pick number 15. So between pick 15 and pick 17, right, right before the Detroit Lions, in those three picks, one of Tampa Bay's top three targets came off the board, according to how I'm reading into this video. Those picks were number 15, edge rusher Will McDonald, the fourth out of Iowa State, going to the New York Jets. Pick 16, cornerback Emmanuel Forbes out of Mississippi State, going to the Washington Commanders. Pick 17, cornerback Christian Gonzalez out of Oregon, going to the New England Patriots. Of those three, to me, it's more likely that Iowa State's Will McDonald IV was that third player on Jason Light and Todd Bowles' three-man big board for pick number 19. Now, nobody outside the NFL expected Christian Gonzalez to make it to number 15, let alone to number 17. But I don't think the Bucs were targeting a perimeter corner just that high, not after re-signing Jamel Dean, not after coming back with Carlton Davis, just looking at the roster, looking at the intention. And the fact that the Buccaneers didn't draft a corner at all until the sixth round, to me, I don't think you miss on your guy, your corner in the first round, and you don't come back to the sixth round uh, and draft a guy. So I don't think it was Christian Gonzalez, and I don't think it was Emmanuel Forbes for that, for that same reason, another perimeter cornerback. Now, the commanders are trying to work him out in the slot, but that's a different story, right? But they did come back and get an off-ball linebacker and an outside linebacker in rounds five and three, respectively. So round five, they got the off-ball linebacker. Round three, they got the outside linebacker. And again, that would lean towards McDonald being the guy because with the New York Jets, Will McDonald the fourth is most likely going to be a defensive end. But with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he would have been a stand-up outside linebacker, which honestly, I think that's where he's best suited anyway. So if he was then the Bucs were very, very happy to see two corners come off the board at 16, 17. And again, you see your guy come off the board at 15, but then 16, 17, you don't. And then Campbell and Cansey, Jack Campbell, the linebacker at Iowa, Kalaja Cansey, the defensive tackle out of Pitt, are on the board with Detroit on the clock, like Bulls said. So to me, it jives. I don't know. To me, that's, that's kind of, uh, it kind of fits, right? So the next question logically becomes, if the Lions take Cansey, then do the Bucs take Campbell? And if the Bucs take Jack Campbell, guys, what happens to Devin White? Now, that goes even further into the speculation conversation. There's nothing in this video that we can draw from to say, well, here's what would have happened. But I honestly feel like if that happens, if the Detroit Lions do go Cansey, and again, they went defensive tackle on day two. So there's, you know what I mean? Like, Kalaj Cansey was probably on their list somewhere. They just had Jack Campbell higher. I honestly feel like if the Lions do go Cansey instead of Campbell, then we do likely see a trade. Go down, and I think we see Devin White get shipped off. And I think you're probably looking at a package that gets the Buccaneers back into pick 30 or 31st with either the Philadelphia Eagles or the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, the problem with that theory is that the Chiefs have kind of steered away from players that really want to get paid a whole lot of money because they've already got a lot of money tied in uh, to their quarterback. So that's a little bit of an issue. But I know that currently there are some sites kind of speculating about the Chiefs uh, trading for Devin White, and the Eagles have also. Uh, kind of had a tendency to not want to pay specifically off-ball linebackers a whole lot of money. Our guys over at Locked On Eagles have talked about that and talked about that specifically when the Devin White trade request came up because, of course, a whole lot of people speculate Eagles. There was that love of, oh, green's my favorite color and all this other craziness. But if the Bucks could have orchestrated a trade with either one of those guys, then they could have come back on the clock at the end of the first round and targeted maybe a pass rusher like George's Nolan Smith, who ended up going to the Philadelphia Eagles, or if they felt like it was the right pick, Kansas State's Felix and Yudike Uzama, who went 31st to the Kansas City Chiefs. So the pick, the player, might have actually been the same guy. You just, you know, end up with a different team, and the Buccaneers essentially end up with Jack Campbell off-ball linebacker in the first round, and then you get an edge rusher, either Nolan Smith or Felix and Yudike Uzama, whoever they feel uh, they're best equipped to win with. Now, wouldn't again, wouldn't likely be a Devin White for a first round pick straight up uh, trade. Tampa would probably have to give up some future picks uh, to sweeten the deal. I'm not talking about anything crazy, but like a fifth or something like that down the road. Maybe you give up Devin White in a fifth and the Chiefs give you a first and a seventh or something. Uh, but they arguably, again, could have come back to could have come back with Jack Campbell playing next to Monte David and then Felix and Uzama or Nolan Smith added to the rotation of Shaq Barrett, Joe Tryon, Shoinka, 
and that would be really interesting. Uh, and then probably see them come back D line. I don't know, second, third round. I don't know how much they were in love with Cody Malkin in the second round, or if that was just kind of an opportune place to take him. Uh, but I, I imagine somewhere in the second, third round, you would have seen that defensive lineman drafted. Uh, obviously, it would have been a totally, totally different class. So, uh, just, just again, I found it interesting. Hopefully, you guys found it interesting. At the end of the day, the Buccaneers have Kalaja Kansi. That's who we're going to be watching. That's who we're going to be talking about. But this is the time of year for some of the speculative type of stuff to come out and to talk about it. And, uh, you know, I know it's the what if type of stuff, the multi dimensional uh, conversations, but I find them interesting from time to time. I thought this one was kind of interesting. And it was fun for me to dive between the lines and see if I could not uh, put on my detective hat and uh, uh, diagnose or, or translate what was happening in the Bucks war room. I don't know if I got it right or not, but to me, it feels like it makes sense. Um, another interesting part of the video, we also got to see Bowles' reaction. Um, he kind of said it was a full circle moment when they drafted Kalaja Kansi. Uh, because Kansi's Northwestern High School out of Miami, Florida, beat Jesuit High School from Tampa in the state semifinals shortly after Bowles arrived to the city. Both of his sons were playing football at the time for Jesuit. So a little bit of an interesting situation there. He said that College of Kansi did a lot of damage in that game uh, as well. So always interesting to look behind the curtain of an NFL franchise, even one that is dropping in the power rankings on a daily basis. But that number is not the only number dropping for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers these days. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Bucks. National confidence in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers isn't the only thing falling since the retirement of quarterback Tom Brady. Because of it, you could go see a Bucks game for as little as $5. You could go watch a team that just won a Super Bowl two calendar years ago for $5. Bucks. Now, granted, that's a preseason game, right, against the Pittsburgh Steelers, but still, it could be pretty cool to go see Baker Mayfield or Kyle Trask get their era started, right? The Baker Mayfield era, the Kyle Trask era could only be one year for either one of them. Uh, could be a lot of years for either one of them. So it would be kind of cool to be on hand the first time they step foot uh, in Raymond James Stadium this season uh, to get started for the Bucs. You never know. Remember, Tom Brady was not supposed to be the greatest quarterback of all time when he first stepped on the field. I remember the New England Patriots were like panicking, like, oh, Drew Bledsoe went out. It's over, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, next thing you know, they've got the greatest quarterback of all time, and they're doing victory laps for 20 years, telling everybody, ha ha, we're smarter than you. No, you just got luckier than everybody. Uh, according to Darren Ravel, Tampa Bay tickets were the fifth most expensive home venue last year alone. Uh, with an average price of $359 per game. This year, that price has plummeted all the way down to $179 per game. That is the third cheapest home ticket in the league, almost a $200 dip uh, on average per game, $180 dip per game. Uh, and sure, look, there's no Brady, so that explains some of the price drop right, obviously. But to me, there's still Mike Evans. There's still Chris Godwin. There's still Levante David. There's still Devin White. And there's some exciting rookies, right? Kalaja Kansi is certainly exciting. I'm excited to see Yaya Diaby, you know, Servassier Dennis we've talked about. You know what I mean? Trey Palmer could be something. Uh, and let's be honest. When Brady arrived, there were pre-Brady fans wearing the status of, of being a pre-Brady Buccaneers fan, kind of like a badge of honor. It was a well-deserved badge of honor. Well, now, before the Bucs have even played a game without Brady, like, like the last time the Buccaneers played, Tom Brady was still on the field, right? Before the Buccaneers have ever have even played a single game without Tom Brady, we're basically right into that that frame of mind that that stage uh, pre Brady where nobody likes the Buccaneers, nobody says they can do anything, nobody picks them to win anything. And fans, you're now back to the pre success Tampa Bay Buccaneers fandom. And the great thing about it is, if this Bucks roster, if this Bucks team comes out and shocks everybody and gets like 12 wins, you could literally put yourself in that pre pre bandwagon bucks camp again by just going to one game. Like you go to one game this season, you go to a home opener for $57 on gametime.com gametime.com. One of my favorite uh, ticket sites that I use. You can literally go to the home opener against Chicago bears, $57 and boom, just like that. You are pre bandwagon bucks fans yet again, just like you were pre Brady. And if this team rattles off 12 wins makes it to the playoffs, wins the NFC South, you can then tell all the like, week eight on Bucks fans that they weren't there when you were there going through the struggles of before week eight. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it would be really funny uh, to see it kind of unfold. Anyway, 
Also, according to game time right now, the most expensive home game that you can see for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now, pretty predictably, right? It's Monday night football. Uh, that home game is Philadelphia Eagles. But even those tickets are starting at $112. Now, starting, you know where those seats are going to be, but they're still $112, relatively cheap considering uh, the, the rest of the, the prices around the league. Uh, the most expensive road ticket, if you want to see the Buccaneers away from Raymond James Stadium, is for their Thursday night football game in Buffalo against the Buffalo Bills. Those tickets are starting at $76. Those tickets are starting at $76, again, according to GameTime.com. Uh, the cheapest road game is currently $27 to see the Buccaneers play in Houston against C.J. Stroud and the Houston Texans. $27. If you're a Bucs fan in Houston, you can see your home team play for $27 bucks against the, uh, the Houston Texans. I was in Houston last year. Not a great venue. Not a lot of excitement. Uh, around that city, around their team. So that kind of explains the uh, the low price there. Coming up tomorrow, James is going to be back, so make sure you come back for that. In the meantime, if you got questions, you can leave those in the live chat, YouTube comments, or email them to LockedOnBucksPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for making Locked On Bucks your first listen of the day, every day for making us part of your day, part of your routine. And if you have anything else Tampa Bay Buccaneers related, you want to know or want to discuss, make sure you follow us both on Twitter at JRCoderscoreBucks at DHarrison82 in the show at Locked on Bucks. Until we speak again, please be safe, be kind, fire the cannons, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked on Bucks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.